All right, good morning, morning. How's everyone? You good? This is a great, you're a good looking group today. I'm really excited uh, about today as a whole. It's going to be great. Welcome to everyone joining us online, wherever you're at, as well as everyone joining us in VR, uh, wherever you're at, virtually. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Um, today, as, as Jeff just kind of rolled out groups, I'm really excited about that because it, it is, it's, it's a little broader in terms of our expression of how we've talked about groups. Um, but meeting that same need and recognizing that people are at different stages at different uh, or different places, different stages of their life. I, re- I recognize even in my own life, it was, you know, I've had guys in my life, other senior pastors I regularly meet with, I still do that, but there have always been kind of unique pockets of people who will minister to me even and kind of become my group at different seasons. This summer, I ended up kind of, this is just a bizarre, I, w- I would say this is a bizarre group that I ended up in. Some guys invited me to go water skiing with them because they knew I was a slalom skier and I love getting out skiing and they're like, hey, so if you want to come meet us, now you got to get, just picture this. The first text I got from these guys, they're like, hey, we're going to be on out there, just meet us, we'll be there at 545 right? You're really excited right now. 545 in the morning. That's right. Morning. 545. They're like, we'll be at 545. And that morning, I think it was, they were predicting a high of 50 that day. You know, it's like early in the morning, you know? And I was like, guys, you're insane. You know, I'm like, (laughs) but I went on out. I started slalom skiing with these guys and we go almost every day, honestly. Um, 6am, 545, something like that. And um, it started with just kind of skiing, but these guys we share life with, you know, because I see them almost every day. Uh, it's a group of Christians, and we just say, here's what's going on every single day. Here's what we're facing. Here's what we're dealing with. And then we pray for each other every day. And it has been, honestly, one of the sweetest things to have that daily touch point. And I get a dozen texts from these guys every day, just encouragement, making fun of each other for those wipeouts. You know, all that stuff that's so important. But I, I'll just, if I could be really honest. Like this past week, my wife and I, we had some really tough decisions we were making, some tough hurdles we were facing. Last Sunday, five o'clock, I get a phone call. And it's three of the guys who I ski with. And they're on a group call. And each guy took some time just to pray for me. And uh, well, well, they didn't know it. And I'm just crying. Just to have guys who would be there, have my back in that moment as we're making tough calls. And um, it's huge. And so while sometimes in the, in the past we almost picture groups, all, all groups happen in a living room. Well, sometimes they happen in a boat. And sometimes they happen at the trailhead of a mountain bike path. And, and sometimes they happen in coffee shops. And, and they happen in lots of, and sometimes they happen in outer space, in virtual reality. And, and sometimes they just happen in all these different environments, but the, the fact is you need people alongside you so that when, oh man, life is hitting the fan, they're calling you. My prayer is not just that you'd hear that and be like, man, I wish I had that, but that you would take a step to do something about it. Because actually, you probably have some people in your life that you could perhaps lead the group or gather some of your few and say, we need to do that for each other. Otherwise, you know what I know will happen? I'll make bad decisions on my own in life. That's what happens. And so having other people is huge. I really could probably say amen, let's go our way today. <laughs> After, after that, because, but that's what I'm actually going to be talking about, this, just the whole message. This is a, a unique Sunday um, in the sense that 12 years ago, today, you want to know what happened? It was my first Sunday working for Lakeland, my first message. First time I preached, and um, man, when you think over these 12 years, what a fun and wild ride it's been since, you know, the old auditorium over there, and then the second auditorium over there, and now this auditorium here, and um, I just have a lot of gratitude, honestly, 
Because when you, this is just me being kind of honest, when you pastor a church, you hope that you won't just be the pastor. You hope that you'll actually find some friends along the way. And I, I'm so, sorry. Uh. This is why I have always a uh, tissue, because I am a crybaby, if you haven't figured that out. I might look tough, but I am not. Uh, you hope that you'll find friends, though. And I'm grateful that I have some real friends in my corner. I'm grateful for each of you. I'm grateful uh, to be a part of a body of believers that... Uh, that holds true to the word of God, that rests everything we do upon the gospel, and upon Jesus Christ, that embraces the fact that none of us have it together, and we're all desperately in need of a savior. And, um, and Jesus did something 2,000 years ago that knits us together and makes us brothers and sisters in spite of the fact that we will do this thing called family in a really messy way. And it won't always be easy. In fact, I can promise you it won't be easy. Um, and yet, the power of the gospel is so profound that we can do this thing called family that's not easy and yet love each other through it and keep pointing people to Jesus and mess up in front of others and still point, keep pointing people to Jesus. Anyone grateful for Jesus? Oh, my word. I am. Have you ever had a difficult day? <laughs> How about a difficult week? Difficult month? Difficult year or years? Man, this is where the body of Christ is so important that you got other people who come alongside you on those days. How do you make it through on those days? Because we'll all face it. There's some verses that actually speak to how you make it through on those days, and we're going to actually look at some of those verses that were written by the big dog we're looking at today. His name was uh, King Solomon. Solomon wrote these things. Here's one of the things that Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Verse 9 10, he said this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, anyone ever fall down in life? I do. If, I, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone, but pity anyone, but pity anyone oh, who falls and has no one to help them up. God designed us to actually do this thing called life together. Not, with, not in the sense that we can know every person. You're not going to know every person in this room. You're not. But that you have some that know you. And you know them. And you're in each other's corner. And you're fighting for one another. And pity the one who falls and doesn't have someone, someone, someone who can pick them up. And it's so important that you have other people in your life that can pick you up and come alongside you. And I don't know if... How many of you have figured this out that not just anyone will do? Have you figured that out? Not just anyone will do. You, it does matter who we pick. I, I remember years ago, uh, this is, we bought, it was Christmas time, I bought three iPod, or, yeah, iPod shuffles for our, off of eBay. And they were a steal of a deal. They were a steal of a deal for a reason, because they were knockoffs. And when I got them and I opened them up and I quickly and I plugged them in and iTunes didn't recognize them, it quickly became obvious. I'm like, oh, these are knockoffs. And, uh, and so I, they became such a headache for me. I had to like convert all of my music into certain formats just to get them on there. And they like sort of worked, but it was just frustrating. It was really maddening and at the end of the day. And I was one of those things, I just wanted to throw them away. Sometimes people are that way. If you get a knockoff, if you get one that's just not worth being with, quite frankly, you should not invest the time in it. <laughs> Honestly. And some of you, prob are, if, if you're really honest, you've had some people in your life who are giving you some bad advice. They've been bad friends. And you need to rotate out your friend group. 
You need to say, all right, these people who have been not helpful for my walk with the Lord, I know they're not leading me to walk in obedience. They are the knockoff of the real thing of what real relationship could look like. And I've got to get rid of that and transfer in some people who are going to actually encourage me to walk in obedience to God, uh, who will encourage me on the days when life's hitting the fan, that they're actually going to point me to Scripture and they're actually going to point me to Jesus. Like, you need that. This is why our big dog also wrote this in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26. He said, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Choose your friends carefully. You can't just choose anyone. Choose your friends and choose them careful, carefully. And what's ironic is that while Solomon wrote those words, he's going to end up not following his own words. And he'll have some people who will lead him astray. I believe there is actually one single move or decision that we can make in life that influences every other decision that we will make in life. And that is how we choose those who are closest to us. It's kind of like the ring of power from the Lord of the Rings. One ring to rule them all. I'm telling you, this is one decision to rule them all. It impacts all other things. And it's, it's this. It's really our big idea for the day. It's that you will become the people you surround yourself with. And biblically, that's true. You, this is why he said, choose your friends carefully. Wicked will lead you astray. You'll become the people who you surround yourself with. I believe it's true, and we're going to actually see that play out in our big dog of the week. Um, if you're going to follow along in your Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 9. That's where we're going to be. Uh, Solomon, let me give you a little context of, of Solomon and who he is and where we're going to pick this story up. Um, he's the son of King David. He becomes king. And there's, this is kind of the big story that's at the beginning of Solomon's life that you need to know, if you don't know, that God appears to Solomon in a dream and says to him this, you can have whatever you want and I'm going to give it to you. Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine if God just basically showed up, wrote you the blank check and, you said, and said, write whatever you want in there and you can have. I don't know what you would ask for. Healing for that family member, uh, maybe a superpower. You're like, I want to be invisible, or I want super speed, or I want... Uh, uh, but you want to know what Solomon asked for? He asked for wisdom. He basically says, I'm super young God, and I've got this great nation that I'm supposed to lead, and I need wisdom to do so. And God says, because you asked for wisdom, and you didn't ask for wealth, you didn't ask for power, you didn't ask for victory over your enemies, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm also going to give you all those other things you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you the wealth, I'm going to give you the power, and I'm going to give you victory over your enemies, because you asked for such a right Thing you asked for wisdom. And so God gives him all that. He gives him wisdom. As a result of it, Solomon builds the most powerful, really, nation, uh, kingdom that ever existed. Peace with more nations around him than anyone else ever in, in all of human history. Uh, the most wealthy uh, kingdom and palace. He builds a temple for the Lord that's just magnificent and beautiful. And um, and so this is where we're going to pick this up. He's built this amazing temple to the Lord, which, side note, do you know where uh, Solomon's temple was located? Side of his head, obviously. <laughs> oh, Lord. It's, I know, it's, it's bad, it's bad. Okay, but, no, Jerusalem, silly. Okay, so uh, this is where we're going to pick this up. First Kings chapter 9, verse 3, Solomon had uh, just built this temple to the Lord. He's kind of consecrated it to the Lord, and this is what the Lord says to him. The Lord said to him, I've heard the prayers and plea that you've made before me. I've consecrated this temple which you've built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness as David your father did and do all I commanded and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised David and your father when I said... You shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. But, listen to this, if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not uh, observe the commands and decrees that I've given you, and you go off and you serve other gods and worship them, then I'll cut off Israel from the land that I've given them. I'll reject this temple that I've consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all the peoples. 
What's he, interesting here, and, and it seems pretty obvious, the Lord is really clear on his ex, expectations. Basically he's saying, I recognize this temple, my presence is gonna dwell here. Here's the really one piece of instruction that I'm gonna give to you. Live faithfully, observe my decrees, and then he includes one warning in there. Now if God gives you a warning, you should probably pay attention to it, right? Wouldn't it be sweet if the Lord just showed up and, said, and just said to you, hey, I got one warning for you. Like, do you think you would pay attention to the one warning from the Lord? You would think you would, right? Yeah, we're probably hard-headed like Solomon, and even he kind of missed it here. But he, here's the one warning. God gives him this one warning, and it's really the other side of the same coin of keep my commands, walk faithfully with me. The opposite side of that coin is this. If you don't follow me faithfully, you'll inevitably start serving other gods and worshiping them. That's, that's the flip side. If you don't follow me faithfully, you don't obey me, you're going to inevitably start following others, worshiping other things, honoring other things with your heart and your mind. And that's exactly what will end up happening. But, but before we get there, chapter 9 and 10, if you read all those chapters in 1 Kings, uh, it's basically Solomon establishing his kingdom. So it's a beautiful kingdom. It's the most magnificent kingdom the world's ever seen. People are traveling. Kings and queens are traveling from all these other nations just to hear Solomon teach because he's the wisest guy that's ever lived on the planet. And he, he just kind of knows everything. He's teaching all these things. And uh, Everything's so prosperous. It's so prosperous that Second Chronicles 9 says this about Solomon's kingdom, that silver was as common as stones. That's it. like, just so you go on outside and you kick some stones. He's like, that is how common silver was. Everyone had it. It's everywhere. It says, and cedar was as plentiful as the sycamore fig trees on the foothills. The sycamore fig trees, they're just like bushes. They just grow everywhere. He's saying cedar was like that. Now, why did cedar matter? Well, because that's what you use to build, and it was long, straight logs. Like, they didn't have, you know, that's what they're using to build with. And so they're like, this was the greatest stuff, was cedar, silver, it was everywhere. Everywhere they were doing so well, they were not in a recession. Inflation had not hit them yet. You know, it was like, it was a sweet time to be alive. And uh, notice what happens. First Kings chapter 11, verse one. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and his wives led him astray. So he had a thousand ladies, 700 wives. Now, there are so many wife jokes I could tell right now, but for the sake of my marriage and every man here, I will hold them all inside. But truthfully, question here, why in the world does Solomon marry so many ladies? It's because it's actually the culturally right thing for him to do. That's why he does it. it in his day and age, a king would marry uh, someone from a neighboring nation when they made peace with that nation. It was better than just a peace treater, treaty because now we became family, we became blood. So actually the sheer number of women that he's married to is actually a symbol of how much peace he had with so many other nations. And so it was a symbolic thing, it was a cultural thing, it was an expected thing that Solomon would do this uh, to demonstrate his peace with everyone. But if I could just give you a quick observation and an application, is just because it's normal doesn't make it good or right. Just because it's normal, and it was normal. Kings intermarry with neighboring nations. That was normal. 
But it's just because it's normal doesn't make it good or right. And even for us, cultural norms or rules, if followed, can still lead us astray. There's lots of things that you could say, and you, if you're a parent, you've, you've heard this from your kids when you've tried to reprimand them on something, and they're like, everyone is doing it, right? Everyone is, and just fill in the blank. What everyone says is okay. What everyone else is doing right now in, in culture, just because everyone's doing it doesn't make it right or good. Everyone bends the truth to make the sale at work. Everyone talks badly about their spouses sometimes in this group. Everyone, you know, gets a little tipsy now and then when out with friends. Everyone's watching that show or that movie or reading that book. Everyone uses that app. We need it, mom or dad, just to stay connected. Everyone lies or bends the truth on that document. Everyone fights with their siblings at times. Everyone, I don't care what it is that everyone does, just because everyone does it or it's culturally acceptable doesn't make it biblically right or good for you. And we're going to see what happens as he follows what everyone does. He marries all these wives from the neighboring nations as he's expected to do. But that cultural rule which he follows will ultimately lead to his crash. That's what we're going to see happen. Check it out. Next verse. 1 Kings 11 verse 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of, his da- uh, of, heart of David his father had been. He followed uh, Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On the east hill of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. What's, uh, he did the same for all of his foreign wives and he burned, or who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. Notice how it starts here. At the beginning of that verse, it says, as Solomon grew old. And and if I could just make an observation, it would be this. Bad relationships with with enough time will break even the wisest individual. Bad relationships with enough time will break even the wisest individual. How is it possible that the wisest person on the planet does something so foolish? You gotta understand, it's not that he just allowed his wives to continue worshiping the gods that they were worshiping prior to the marriage. It says at the end of his life, he built the high places. Meaning Solomon put his own dollars, his own effort, and his own purpose into the worship of false gods. That's how far it led him astray that not only did he allow it. See, what happens is bad relationships over time will lead you so far astray that what you once put up with, you now support. That what you once were tolerant to, you actually get behind. And it's so critical that you have not just anyone in your life, you you got to have the right people in your life who will constantly go back to Scripture and say, okay, I understand that culturally this is what everyone else is saying, but let's just open God's Word together. Let's just look at Scripture, and you're going to see something that's consistent across the whole of Scripture, and it's that what you're doing right now is sin. Let's get back on track, and let's do it quickly. Right? we got to have people in our lives who can love us that way and call us out that way. Because you will become the people you surround yourself with. The direction of your closest relationships will determine the direction of your life. Or I've said it this way before, is that you are the average of the five people that you hang around with most. You are. You just become that. It shows the power of, of, and the influence of relationships. The people you surround yourself with matters. So choose wisely. And now is the time really to make that commitment. If you're sitting here going, I need people in my life. Well, then make that commitment. Make it now. Be determined. In about a month, a lot of our groups are going to be taking off. So say, all right, right now, during this month, I'm going to find 
a group that I, and I'm going to make a commitment to get in a group so that in a month when it gets ready to launch, I've got my ducks in a row and I'm ready to join in with that group or start saying, okay, I want, I want to lead a group. I'm going to get some of my friends and we're going to come alongside you. We're going to help you be successful in that. And so uh, follow up with us and we want to help you be able to launch a group. But now is the time to make that commitment um, to get in a group or start a group. Let me just give you two really quick reality checks, okay, for groups as a whole. Because I think these are, we, a lot of times we have this, um, I don't know, it, it's, it's the fairy tale version of what a group should look like, where we all sit together and we sing kumbaya and everything's always perfect. And it's, how many of you figured out it's not that way? It's just not. It's not that way. So two reality checks for groups, okay? I just need to say them. One, your group will change and morph over time and that's okay. Sometimes your closest and your best group that you've had, you might feel like, we're going to be friends forever. And then you're really confused when you're not. Or you're really confused when a group, when, some, when like a, a core couple in your group or a core person says, I'm going to launch my own. And you're like, what? You, you can't. Like we were forever friends. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're still friends. Okay, I'm just launching my own group. It's okay. Like there will be different seasons in life. My parents are 72 and they said my, like all their friends are going south all the time. And they're like, it's hard to do a group as it once was. And so there's different seasons. You might say, hey, our group now meets seasonally. We meet here and then we got a group down there. We may meet online. I don't know. You, there's different seasons. You might have some people who transition out. And guess what? It's okay to have new people transition in. I know, it'll upset the, the apple cart. No, it's okay. Your group will change over time and that's okay. Just be ready. That's just a reality check. Second thing, someone in your group at some point is gonna let you down. Let me just say it again. Someone in your group at some point is going to let you down. Someone's gonna hurt you. But here's the deal. You will have many Let me say it again, many, let me say it again, many uplifting moments with the group as a whole, and you might have a few letdowns. Don't let the few letdowns rob you of the many uplifting moments. And yet we do it all the time. We let the few, I got let down once, never again. Don't do that. We are imperfect people and imperfect people are a part of imperfect relationships and we make imperfect choices and we make mistakes. So don't let the few mistakes, the few letdowns rob you of the many moments that you need in your life to uplift you and move you forward. It doesn't mean that you don't have to do real business with the Lord around that letdown or around that hurt in terms of forgiving that person. Like, hey, this is a great Spiritual growth moment, right? I gotta learn how to forgive people. That's a part of life. Are you, are you ready for like a mind-blowing idea? My wife and I, our marriage is not perfect. What? That's right, we fight at times. But just because, and guess what? On those days, I've let my wife down. But because of the letdowns, we don't kiss the whole thing goodbye, right? It's obvious in a marriage setting. And so in, relationally, in a relational group setting, we, we've got to have that same perspective. There will be letdowns. There will be moments that it's not perfect, but we continue to press in this thing called relationship because we need it. We're designed for it. Pity the man, Solomon said, who falls or woman and doesn't have someone to pick them up. You need that person in your life. Here's another kind of, uh, so 12 years ago, first day here at Lakeland, let me give you another kind of anniversary moment, is that this past week, my wife and I, we had our anniversary, um, so 24 years, and uh, it's, yeah, it's super sweet, awesome time, and um, so obviously this past week, we would have been on our honeymoon 24 years ago, and on our honeymoon, I'm going to tell you one story, a totally clean story, Okay. <laughs> So it was on our honeymoon. We were on a cruise. We were down, uh, I don't know, in the Bahamas. And one day we decided to go snorkeling. And so we'd rented some snorkeling gear. And I hadn't, I'd been in the ocean before, but I hadn't really been snorkeling. And so they we're getting our gear. And they had this like big roped off area for like all the people on the cruise ship. It's probably like the size of four football fields. It was huge. And so it's like a big area where you can snorkel within. And the guy had said, hey, just P.S., it is, uh, it's, it's jellyfish season. And so just, and he had one in like a jar. He's like, this is what it looks like. Try to stay, steer clear of them. Otherwise you might get stung by one. And so I'm like, okay, 
My wife and I looked at it, we're like, stay away from jellyfish, got it. And so we go on out and we're snorkeling and we're having a great time and we're seeing amazing fish. It was beautiful. Every once in a while you'd see a jellyfish floating in front of you and you just kind of swim around it and, and get you know, away from it. And uh, we've been out there for like an hour and a half and they told us, they said, hey, if you want to see some stingrays, you got to go kind of to the edge of where all this roped in area is, but go way on out there, you'll be able to see some. So after about an hour and a half, I looked to my wife and I said, hey, let's go on out there. Let's see if we can see some stingrays. And so so she agreed. And so we ha- start heading out that way. But as we're heading out that way, you could see on the horizon, there's these really dark clouds on the, just coming on. And I was like, well, you know, they're going to call us in if there's a problem. Let's just keep going. So we go about another 10 minutes further out to sea. And, uh, and as we're heading out there, we're, we got our faces in the water and we're looking at the fish are amazing. It's beautiful. It looks so great. All of a sudden, we hear the siren because we're, our faces are in the water. We're not paying attention. And the siren's going off. And then they're on the speaker saying, everyone, it's time to head on in. Uh, storm is coming. And we look up and this storm that was way off there is now like upon us. And is coming in, and it's coming in fast. And so Lisa and I, we turn around, we start swimming on in. And as we start swimming on in, all of a sudden I start seeing all these jellyfish come in on this one side. And I was like, oh, so we turn and we start going this way. All of a sudden I see... Uh, group of jellyfish on this side. So, oh, and all of a sudden we come on and there is this, I mean, it is a finding Nemo moment. There's a wall of jellyfish in front of me. And well, it storm had brought in all these jellyfish. And so we are like cut off from shore wall of jellyfish in front of us. Immediately we pop up out of the water. We're looking at one another, you know, talking to one another. And we're like, and, and I go, Babe, and I looked under, and you could dive down and swim underneath the jellyfish. They were like kind of in the top six feet of water, floating there, thick. And I said, babe, we're going to dive down under. And she goes, no, we're not. <laughs> I was like, come on. We got, now this is like, you know, this is your marriage. This is one week into it. You want to treat this thing gently, you know? And so when she's like, no, we're not. I'm like, okay, we are not. And so I was like, well, then try to stay right on my tail. And I'm going to try to lead us through the jellyfish to the best of my ability. And so we start going through these jellyfish and I start swimming. I'm just trying to dodge them going in and out and they start getting really thick. And the next thing I know, my wife's not following behind me. She is on my back, (laughs) arms on my shoulder, head out of the water, (laughs) knees on my back like this. I am fully her boat at this point. And I'm just going through, and the whole time she's hearing out of my snorkel, uh, 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 as I'm getting stung and stung and stung going through this wall of jellyfish. And as we come up to shore, and I'm peeling off all the junk, and and I'm dropping it on the the shore, and I look at her, I was like, how many times did you get stung? Because I got stung at least 50 to 100 times. And and she goes, she goes, none. I was like, you go back out there and you get stung. I was just, I was so mad. And, and honestly, it was like one of those things, it was just so comical. I didn't know, I didn't know if I was going to die right there in the moment. I didn't know that like jellyfish thing would like go away in 15 minutes, which is exactly what happened. But it, at the moment, I was like, this is crazy, it was horrible. But for my wife, she froze in fear. And all she could do was ride someone else's back. And there will be a time in your life when life hits the fan, fear captures your heart, you don't know what to do other than grab onto someone else and ride. And the question is, do you have someone who will carry you through those moments? Because you need that. You need it desperately. Don't say, well, someday. No, today. Find those relationships because pity The fool who has no one, who falls and has no one, you need that person. Why don't you stand? We'll close here in prayer. And I'm going to give you a heads up, okay? At the end of our service, our prayer partners are always available here at at the front. But I just want to say this to you. Last Sunday when those three guys called me, I so desperately needed that phone call. Maybe right now in your life, you don't have three guys or three gals who would call you and pray for you because they know exactly what you're going through. If you don't have that group of people, but you're like, hey, this week I'm making some hard decisions. This week I got a really hard thing I'm facing. Or right now I'm in a really tough season. 
May our prayer partners this morning be your stand in small group until you get that group, okay? And so don't leave here without just saying, hey, I need someone. I need someone to just pray for me. Pray for wisdom. Pray for, for, for successful decisions. Pray for whatever it is that you need. Until you have those people, may our prayer partners be your stand-in. And we want to partner with you, okay? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our big dog. Um, he modeled, he said some brilliant things, but he didn't even follow his own advice. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be, honestly, wiser than Solomon in our action. We may not be wiser in our thoughts, but we can be wiser in our action. And we can learn from him and learn from his words. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to do the wise thing and get people around us who will encourage us and lift us up. If there's wounding from past uh, relationships that went south or that people let us down, Lord, I pray that you would just really be gentle in guiding us through the process of forgiving and letting those people off the hook so that the rest of our lives are not robbed of missing out on the many uplifting moments that come from having others in our lives. So Lord, we just need your help to do this thing called uh, relationships with one another better, but we know we need each other. Thank you for each other. This big dysfunctional family, I'm honestly very grateful for it. I'm thankful for that Jesus knits us together. I give you glory and praise. Amen. If we can pray for you, please come on forward. Our prayer partners will be up here as well as online. Share with us how we can pray for you. If you want to support the ministries here, there's ways to give in the back as well as online. Be blessed. We'll see you guys next week. Lakeland family, thank you so much for joining us online today. Like Josh said, if you are in need of prayer, you can find prayer partners in the chat, and we know that there are people out there who would love to pray with you. So hey, Josh, great hey, message. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Um, so right at the beginning of the message, you talked about uh, this group of friends that you kind of yeah, yeah. almost stumbled across, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think what's been really sweet is, uh, once again, we just ended up in a boat together. I just wasn't, you know, it's was just one of those deals where I thought, man, we're going to have fun and we're going to water ski and, mm -hmm. and, and that type of thing. But what quickly became really evident was, man, how we just started sharing with one another. Here's what I'm going through. I mean, it, it is a rare occasion, honestly, that there's not tears mm -hmm. around the back of a, you know, the tail sure. of uh, tailgate of the boat when we pull it at the end of skiing sure. on a regular basis where we're just kind of sharing, here's what's going on and we're praying for each other. And uh, man, I just, I never thought though, you know, a lot of times uh, that, that that type of friendship or those type of guys in my corner could exist maybe in that setting even, just kind of like around a boat. And I think that's why I, would, that's why I shared it because I mm -hmm. feel like so often, even for me, I've maybe portrayed groups happened in a living room and it's been so sweet that I think some of these sweetest relationships have happened for me on a boat mm -hmm. as opposed to on a dock versus yeah. in, a, in a living room. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because life isn't perfect. Life is spontaneous sometimes yeah. and you know it isn't just one thing right um and i love um how the lakeland groups uh we're not just maybe putting it into a box yeah, yeah. Uh, i know in the past we've like you said it's maybe a living room setting uh, but i love the opportunity to do life differently yeah. uh, maybe talk a little bit more like what pastor jeff had mentioned. yeah so he was talking about about how we've re how we're recasting or rethinking about the whole vision of groups and really so much of this is driven by we recognize we always had things like celebrate recovery which is all about you know helping people find freedom um we had things like um I would call them a seasonal group or, or an intensive like um, Financial Peace University. And so what we were often trying to do is we were trying to funnel all these things into a single group's model mm -hmm. as opposed to just embracing the fact that like, no, that is a legitimate group for that season of whatever you're like, you need that right now. And just to validate that mm -hmm. and say, right now you just need freedom or right now you just need you know, this intensive kind of discipleship around maybe your finances, or even we've had groups who are doing like me and three type thing. It's like really intensive. It's a small knit group of maybe three people. Um, and 
for years, I think they felt bad. Like, well, there's only three of us. We're failing. As opposed to like, no, you're actually winning. You're just doing this thing called intensive groups. Yeah. And so trying to recognize that and then helping people realize that you could lead a group depending on your season or you can get into a group depending on whatever season you're facing. Mm -hmm. We've got a group for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you heard it online, family. If you were afraid to join a group because maybe a stigma that was attached to it or you had this uh, vision that you thought, oh, I won't belong in that. Uh, we're just here to encourage you. No, there is a group for you. Uh, it just looks different than what you have maybe imagined in the past. And we would love for your help. So online family, if you want to lead a group, check out the information in the chat and become one of our digital leaders. And we would just love that to advance God's kingdom even further. We hope that you have a great week and we will see you next week.